The following was recorded in front of a live studio audience at the Studio 21 Podcast Cafe. This is the United Podcast Network. Welcome to the Quirky Dog Podcast, inspired by some of the quirkiest dogs you can ever imagine and the owners who love them. This podcast is brought to you by the quirky couple themselves, Scott and Jess Williams. Their aim is to educate and entertain. Here's Scott and Jess. Welcome, guys, and happy Wednesday. We're coming to you live from Salem, New Hampshire, and today we're going to talk all about chewing. Destructive behavior. Puppies Puppy biting on your arms, making you bleed. Self-destructive, self-mutilating chewing. We're going to talk about chewing. I'm really excited. But first, we're going to start with the quirky tip of the day. All right, my quirky tip of the day is this stuff. Um, you can get this at most pet stores and Amazon and stuff. It's the bitter apple that they sell. And I am not a huge fan of putting it on, like, bedding and furniture and everything else. I'm more of a go-to of, like, I'm going to manage my dog. But anytime there's any cosmetic, like, chewing going on, especially this time of year, it's hot, right? Cousteau, his mouth had, like, this little spot missing from his fur the other day. A little hot out, spot. Yeah, maybe a hot spot or maybe a previous tick. I don't even know, but it just was, like, a little itch mark. Put this on. You make sure it's not anything more serious. The dog's not in pain, everything else. So I really like the bitter apple. Um, Some and, dogs really like it, too. <laughs> it depends on the They don't care dog. one bit. It depends on the dog. But I would check out bitter apple, especially as it relates to chewing and, you know, stuff that's going on with your dog's body. It's a, it's a full-on wound. I don't want you to put bitter apple into a wound. But if it's just something that they're just starting to get at, try it out. I like it. Yeah. works pretty well for me. My first go-to. If you find yourself spraying it on the legs of your table and on the couch, yeah. you know, the, there's a bigger problem yeah. going on there. <laughs> You're not managing well. So let's yeah. let's start with this. So... When would you, uh, outside of when teething occurs, when would you say puppy chewing and adolescent chewing and stuff is reasonable with like a time frame of age? What would your go-to be? You mean when it tends to subside? No, like when you would attribute it to, okay, well, it's a puppy. It's a, it's I would like, say from the day you bring the dog home up until they have their adult teeth in, they're going to be going through, uh, there's going to be various motivations for them to be biting and chewing on things. Okay. Their gums are going to be itchy. Baby teeth are coming in, baby teeth are falling out, new teeth are coming in, there's a lot going on there. So uh, just like a, a human baby is crying a lot because their gums are bothering them, a puppy will want to chew to kind of alleviate that pain a little bit. So when the full adult set of teeth come through and they're there, and that's going to be different be per breed, per six, everything months, else. Yeah, like it that. could be a little bit later depending on the dog. But, I mean, I was thinking about it with our dogs. I don't really think we have a lot of... Like, destructive things they did. Jimmy chewed the seatbelt handle in the tr pickup truck and your agenda, like your book, he your chewed planner one of my, book. He uh, charging cords for the phone in the truck. He, he had too much freedom. Yeah, I had him in the front <laughs> seat of the truck. Jimmy was losing the drive at four months old. Yeah, well, he was uh, maybe a little bit older than that. But, yeah, he wasn't ready for that much freedom yet. And uh, But the thing was, I, as soon as, and we're talking minimal, minimal, he just chewed on the corner of my planner. And so then he was just in a crate when I wasn't, yeah. you know, when I was traveling, he'd be in the crate. But I can't even think of anything like he our chewed. current dogs have done. It was weird. He was also chewing on the concrete block. Yeah, he block. had a weird like obsession. Uh, another when dog he had was peed little. on the block yeah, or something. He, he wanted dirt and like cinder blocks. Like he was weird when he had, he had some weird obsessions. But beyond that, I guess Jimmy's quite destructive. But beyond that, I can't think of a lot of things any of our current dogs have done. Like you look at that, like, oh, that dog chewed it and ruined it. And our dogs are really supervised and we create a lot of structure. We're not expecting everyone to do that. But our thought would be, if you see a dog chewing on, you know, a leg of a chair or something on your dining room table, start to manage the dog's access to that room. Make sure you're supervising the dog in that room. It just could be too much freedom. If it's just chewing out of boredom, I, teething or not, that should not be happening. You don't want your dog destroying your place. Yeah, and for some reason, and I say this because the majority of my clients tell me this, getting toys for them to chew on doesn't work. They just get yeah. bored with the toys. And, f and I think it has to do with flavors uh, that they start chewing on, a, you know, a leg of a chair well, or something. Well, lack of interaction. You were talking about it even in relation to the flirt Yeah, pole. but the, the table isn't doing anything. And yeah, that's And they're chewing true. on the corner of the table. But the wood, dogs yeah, even the like wood, the wood and, and the splintering. And that's the thing. They can stuff. actually start to destroy it, which yeah. is fun in and of itself. But I don't usually use toys f to alleviate chewing or to pacify dogs because most dogs don't care unless the toy is active and you're working with them which is another, another thing to do. Yeah. But I always tell people get either a Kong that you can pack with peanut butter or, you know, their kibble mixed with yogurt and freeze it 
and that's something that can hold them over. We, we like marrow bones. Yeah. Uh, it can upset a puppy's stomach, so we don't give it to them for two hours. And then th that's the other side of the coin. If you have something the puppy loves to chew on, don't let them chew on it for an hour and a half because yeah. all that saliva going in their stomach, they can now get diarrhea. They can have all kinds of other issues. So you And wanna... if it's a big chew and something that could upset yeah. their GI system, yeah, the longer, the more it's <clears> going to be <throat> happening. And then that is another good point to bring up. If the puppy is loving something and like ferociously chewing something for, you know, 20 minutes, 45 minutes, an hour, that's a lot of work too, right? Like the puppy is going to be thirstier from the salty treat and everything afterward. The, the, energy that it put into chewing this thing. So be conscious of how much access the dogs are getting and not. And Scott says we like marrow bones and it's not that we don't. I'm all about, you know, even like the little butcher ones and stuff, especially as puppies are growing up and everything else. As our dogs become more like adult dogs and I mean, Vital's five now, that's our youngest dog. I would prefer to give the dog something like a farmhound's hide. Uh, we had farmhounds on the podcast, love the company, really all about them. I feel better about the dog's teeth, giving them something like that. They come with fur, without fur. Um, marrow bones, I, I, my older Mal snapped a tooth, a, a bottom molar one time with a marrow bone. So I'm careful of that as the dogs get older with their teeth. But give them something that they can't just swallow, right? If you start to do some research on rawhides, especially those made overseas, the bully sticks, there's a lot of veterinary concerns with these products. And I get it. We want our dogs to enjoy something. We want to give them something to do. We want to make sure they're, you know, kept kind of supervised, maybe while you're cooking or something. But if you're just constantly giving them another chew, another bully stick, another rawhide and everything else, and they're swallowing big parts of these things, it can be dangerous to their systems as well. So it's important to be conscious of. Yeah. And as they, as it gets smaller, like whenever we give our dogs something new to chew on, typically we'll put them on their bed. So now they're stabilized. They're in one place and we'll be on the couch and we're just not staring at them the whole time, but we're conscious they have yeah. this thing, they're chewing on it. It's certainly like we have these big rubber balls that my Malinois likes to chew on. The star mark balls. He's very strong with the jaw strength. And so he can gnaw on that thing for a long time. But as soon as we start to see a piece coming off, we take it away and that thing goes in the trash. So we're very conscious of what they have, how long they have it, is what they're eating be starting to break down where they could start ingesting something they shouldn't be ingesting. Yeah. And that's just part of owning a dog. And that's, you know and we're I mean? a little more careful than maybe some other <clears throat> people may be. I get that. Our protocols are a little more intense. Maybe I used to like the knuckle bones. And then I realized that the mouths can get those down really small and just swallow the whole piece if they needed. Like we just don't want a lot of extra hassle with our dogs. So, and what Scott's saying about like how we have a ritual and a procedure for it, it's true. And you should have this too. Like, okay, we had dinner. We're going to have some TV time. I'm going to give the dog his chew for an hour. If the chew is always just laying on the ground, it's going to have less value. If it's not a super savory, special something that, you know, your dog's like, oh my gosh, this is so great. If you can't take it away from your dog, these are all little things to consider. Because if, yeah, yeah, yeah. if you have 25 chews just laying all over your house and you're stepping on them barefoot in the middle of the night going to pee and your dog's still destroying your, you know, dining room table, there's another issue going on here. So let's look at what's going on and is it working right now for you and your dog and how can we fix it if it's not? Yeah, you want to um, hopefully evaluate and come to the reason why they're chewing. What's the motivation? If it's a puppy, they're teething, we know what the motivation is. If it's an older dog getting to be about a year old and they're destructive, it could be bad habits from puppyhood. Uh, it could be some anxiety developing. It oh, could be they sure. only chew on the carpet when we leave the house, that kind of thing. They or only... when this kid gets home from school, they only <laughs> chew on the carpet when this energy enters the room. Like you could start to see triggers there. And that's a great point that Scott brings up. Like it, some dogs like to be destructive with toys, right? You give them one of those fluffy toys, all of a sudden they're ripping it up, they're dissecting it, there's fuzz all over. They're like, whoa, look at, I did an operation. We own dogs like that. I'm not going to say like, oh my gosh, I don't need to go and have a big consult with a behaviorist and figure out what's going on here. I don't give my dogs toys to destroy and, you know, de-shred and all this stuff. Like I, I'm conscious then of, okay, if you're going to be an ass with your toys, you're not going to be rehearsing that behavior or you're going to be supervised with that behavior. Even if they're just taking squeakers out and fluff out and not swallowing it, if there's no risk of obstruction, it's still a behavior. I don't want them repeating. I don't want them destroying things and learning to be like, oh, look, this is such a party. So be conscious of the dog you have and what you're allowing them to or not do. And if you do have dogs that are like, oh my God, Petco toy, here we go. Let's throw a confetti party. I really like the brands Westpaw. 
And I think Soda Pop is the other one. I don't own a lot of Soda Pops, but there are toys that are more indestructible. I wouldn't recommend you leave the toy alone with the dog in the crate, like Scott saying about these Starmark balls and stuff. But there are toys that are more durable, and they're not just always the Kong brand. Yeah, and that being said, the Rawhide, you know, generally speaking, I always tell people, no, they're no good. They're not digestible. They can get intestinal blockage and that kind of stuff. But <clears throat> it really depends on the size of the dog. I mean, if you give and yeah, the dog an, a nice big yeah. rawhide, they can work on that for a while without any danger to them. It's something they enjoy. But I would, when, when they're done with it or you decide they're done with it, I would take it, put it in, and we have a drawer full of half pieces of raw hides. And we don't leave that stuff Farm around hides, because yeah. we don't want a dog to pick one of those little pieces up when we're not aware of it and swallow it. And then a day later, they're throwing up. They can't drink water. There's some kind of blockage going on. So we, def we, we used to save the small ones for our Pomeranian. She's no longer with us. So they get tossed. I mean, we, we get them to a point where if they can get the whole thing in their mouth and we can't see it, that's too long. Yeah. That thing has to be taken away and thrown away. Yeah. And, you know? and other houses have other policies, and some dogs are more thoughtful about these things, but we have client dogs. We have our own dogs. We don't want them picking something up and having an issue. Okay, when we get back, we're going to talk about more about chewing and also about how to keep these puppies engaged while they're going through their teething to feel better during that process. Want to keep up with all the latest from the Quirky Dog Podcast like me and Murphy here? Then make sure you head on over to the YouTube channel and subscribe. Or if you prefer to listen to the madness, go on over to iTunes or Spotify and follow the Quirky Dog Podcast. And hey, while you're there, leave a rating and review and let them know what you think of the show. Until then, keep it quirky. Okay, we're back. All right, to talk about the flirt pole thing, because you were talking about this in relation to tugging and all well, of this. Well, as it relates to toys, fluffy toys, and things that you would like your dog to engage with that they may not have any interest in. I think half the reason there's no, the, the toy is dead. It's just laying there. Yeah. They don't have enough drive to just want to destroy whatever you happen to give them. So, but they do like things that have flavor in them. And what I have um, told my, and the problem is, I t first I told people, you know, try to activate the toy, put some prey drive in it, move it around, get the puppy excited about it. And then they tell me the dog is biting their arms, not the toy, because they're putting too much motion into their body instead of having it just in the actual toy you want the dog to focus on. So a nice thing is to buy, and they have them on Amazon, but it's like a little fishing pole. It's just a little short rod with a, with a string, parachute cord with the toy on the end of it. And you want to keep your body, st it's all in the wrist. You don't even want to be moving, forget about moving your whole body. You don't even want to be moving the arm. It's just like this, and it's the toy going back and forth on the floor. The dog can get excited about that toy on the ground and once they pick it up, you can tug with them, but you're not, you don't have your hand on the toy. They're not going to no. accidentally bite your fingers or any of that stuff. And that's a really great toy to get. So the dog can express some energy, the mouthy behavior, everything into this little, and even kids can do this. You know, I mean, if the dog understands the game. It's a great thing to do. Yeah, and, and Scott you put was it away when you're not using it. In relation it. to, you know, puppies get real <laughs> chewy on toys and stuff with all of this. And yes, especially if you're developing a dog's bite or a puppy's bite, you know, and they're going through the teething phase, you can see a little bit of drop off. Frankly, if you're tugging with the dog, you know, in a way that is safe and productive and that creates fun and the dog has enough drive, I haven't seen many of our dogs kick out of drive as they teethed, but that's just... No, but some do, and that there. doesn't yeah. matter. I mean, and if but it's it's a good way to get the puppy more engaged, <clears throat> more centered on the toy, not just chewing up and down. And same thing as these special chews, right? You get out a toy that's either on a leash and or a flirt pole or something like that, then you put it away. Make sure it's interactive. Make sure it's a way to expend the puppy's energy, and you know, like, okay, we had a 10-minute session of this. The puppy's going to be tired out. I'm going to take it for a pee, put it in the crate. We're probably going to get a good nap in. Structure your day and be strategic about how you introduce these different activities and exercises to set yourself up for success. Because if you wake up at 6 a.m. and do all your play and then you have, you know, two hours of work calls at 10 a.m., you're going to have to do something else to get the puppy's energy out then. So be thoughtful of how you're spending your time and structuring your day when it comes to these activities. Yeah, and with a puppy, <coughs> excuse me, I have a little bit of COVID cough going Long on Long COVID going on. Yeah. Um, when you're playing these little tug games uh, with a, you know, four or five-month-old puppy, 
Uh, it helps to uh, loosen up those baby teeth, yeah, too. Yeah, that's true. And then they, they come start right popping out. out when you're, you're playing with a rag. <laughs> you and move the you know, process right couple along. A <laughs> couple of teeth pop out, and you help them alleviate that little irritation. That's true. All right, so let's talk about um, destructive chewing and even self-destructive chewing. So clearly there's puppy chewing. We've talked about that. If you see a certain thing that the puppy keeps going back to, keeps doing, restructure where the crate is, restructure the puppy's access to that room, restructure what's happening. So as we well know, repetition builds behavior. So you don't want the dog doing this a hundred times the first month of its life and then expect, you know, the second month in your home, all that behavior will be over, even though he's done that multiple times every single day last month. So repetition builds behavior, set your puppy up for success. If you have destructive chewing, um, into adulthood, I would go back to management, supervising, everything else. We're talking more crate time, more structured time with your dog. Maybe teach your dog a bed command so the dog just can't be floating around the house. It actually can be stabilized at first. But as Scott said, sometimes these things can factor into anxiety. And it happens with us too. Vital loves to rip leaves, right? Like I can take her to the forest. She can hike with the ball in her mouth, but if she wants to stop and sniff, she'll drop it. She'll start ripping leaves. Total anxious behavior, weird, quirky behavior, don't like it, whatever. I can manage it, right? I can make sure she has a toy in her mouth. I can put a gentle leader on when I walk through leafy areas and everything else. But I'm admitting like, oh, okay, that's a sign that my dog could have a little bit of anxiety. She's drivier than freaking most dogs that were ever made. Fine. I'll give you that. That happens. When it comes to the self-destructive behaviors, that's when the anxiety is really becoming... Dangerous, I guess. Yeah, and dangerous. Like, I don't know. So uh, one quick thing that I would say that I see a lot of, and I will say now that we've been doing this for four years, just us, and especially now that the dogs are more of like in a home setting, these instances have gotten fewer and fewer over the years, but licking. So dogs that come in and they're stressed to be in a new environment, whether they're stressed to be away from their parents, they're stressed to be in a kennel. I don't know what it is, but they start this anxious licking. Well, if that's left to its own devices, then they can start nibbling in an area and the you know, hair is missing. Then they can start doing this more. It's bothering them physically, but it also is mentally giving them an outlet. So that is one thing that I commonly see. And anytime the dog is chewing anywhere, whether it's just scratching itself quickly, I'm making note of that, whether it's our dogs or pet dogs or anything else. If the dog's consistently going back and biting at its ass, why is it doing that? Does it have an anal gland issue? Does it have a tick on it? Does it have a little bump there? Is there something going on? And the sooner I notice the behavior, I record the behavior in my mind and I make sure, okay, like, is this getting worse? Is, did, did he do it again today? Did he did it six times the next day? The quicker I can diagnose something too. So it's really important to see what's happening and then to quickly intervene. Maybe I'm coning a dog. Maybe I'm spraying a dog. Maybe I'm taking that dog for a two mile walk to just kind of, you know, let it just decompress and be out. Not big training, but how am I changing this so that behavior is changing? Not that this is getting worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. Yeah. It could be with an older dog that really didn't have these problem behaviors and then starts this um, chewing on themselves. It could be a structural issue. It could yeah. be a, a hip, a little arthritic hip that's could bothering be. them. They don't know why it's bothering them, but they start, you know, kind of self-soothing and sucking in that area and chewing in that area, trying to alleviate this irritation in there. So there's a lot of things to consider. The age of the dog, you know, has it ever done this before? Because it may have nothing to do with anxiety. Yeah. It's just they're feeling some pain in a joint, you know, that yeah. kind of thing can but, pop up And then too. maybe you're now supplementing that. And it's not that you're not bringing them to the vet if you have like a serious hair spot missing or hot spot or something else, but these things frequently keep recurring or they frequently keep being in the same place. Or there's a leg of a dog that has a red spot from consistent licking from that area and nothing orthopedic is diagnosed. If it's coming, if it's stemming from some sort of thing going on inside of your dog's mind, let's come up with a plan so it cannot have access to it. It cannot, <clears throat> it, it can change that behavior, right? Sometimes it can be as simple as scratching. You know, the dog has either a collar on or sometimes zero collars. The dog's just stressed. Dog starts scratching its neck. The owner's like, Oh, what's the dog doing? It gets the owner's, that's the dog's go-to now is scratching. Some dogs lick their private parts. Like that's something that they do. If you can't interrupt that and it becomes a obsessive thing, then you need to know why that is happening and come up with a plan to make that better. Similar thing too, I want to talk about with chewing as far as it relates to eating. So, so many people have this policy of like free feed. I'm going to put, you know, kibble in the bowl in the morning and the dog will just eat. 
I want you to ask yourself, when is the last time I actually saw my dog eating? Because to me, it is a huge indicator how well our dogs are feeling, if there's any mouth pain, anything else with how they eat, right? Because our dogs don't eat kibble, but if I give them hard treats, if they're not eating them comfortably on either side of their mouth, I'll look in their mouths. I'm looking in our dog's mouths pretty frequently because I check every time I do their nails or they're hanging out with us on the couch or something else. But if they used to eat normally and now they're like kind of shoving their food into the backside of one side of their mouth, there may be pain on that other side of the mouth. That's important to note. Like these are all things that people don't consider, but when the dog starts chewing differently, that's normally the sign of pain in the mouth before there's some sort of abscess, before there's some sort of infection, before it becomes this big, you know, multi thousand dollar vet bill for dental stuff. So be thoughtful of these things and chewing really matters. And yes, it's a great outlet for dogs, but if it's something that doesn't have a productive kind of, um, direction, that's not necessarily the best thing for the dog or your house. Yeah. I mean, the thing that actually made me think about this topic was I was at a client's house, uh, I don't know, within five days ago and they had a blanket over the ottoman and they said, and they almost, well, they just pulled the blanket up today. Hey, look at this. They pulled the blanket up and it's just particle board. Like the whole corner of the ottoman is gone. There's no upholstery. There's no padding, just particle board. And I said, well, how the heck did that happen? I mean, well, the, the puppy is it's a six-month-old dog now, puppy, and as I was chewing on it. And I said, do you, where are you? Do you not see it? Oh, yeah, yeah, we see it. We let him chew on it because, you know, it's just the ottoman. And I said, well, and then I looked down on the rug, and there's a big hole, like the whole side. There's a big, like, half moon taken out of the rug, a throw rug. And I said, what about the rug? Well, yeah, we let the dog chew on the rug, too. So for me, it's it's beyond the cost of furniture and rugs. It's more about the health of the dog. I said, if the dog ingested a, a, an upholstery tack or a staple, now all of a sudden you have a punctured uh, intestine, you have septic, yeah. you had huge, I mean, you yeah. killed, the dog could die. You wouldn't and, know it until the dog is really far along. And do you want the dog rehearsing these behaviors at a hotel, at your in-law's house? Like, are these behaviors that, you know, your dog isn't just going to stop doing if it's used to chewing on rugs and chewing on furniture, that's fine. But then also let's go back to why does it feel the need to do that? I feel like so frequently people say, you know, oh, here's the bed exercise, like have the dog on the bed for a half an hour or so. And then people ask, can the dog have a chew on the bed? Sure. Yeah, he can, but I don't want the dog just staying on the bed because his freaking chew is there. I don't want it to be a convenient way for the dog to park himself for a half an hour. I want the dog to be able to show some self-control to stay on a bed for a half an hour. So, and I fall into this habit a lot. I don't want to deal with my dogs at the middle of the night here or at the end of the day here to have a chew, have a toy, go do your own thing, whatever else. Well, can my dog just lay there passively also, or do I have to give my dog something to do to shut my dog up at the end of the day, to pacify my dog, to keep my dog satisfied? So if you're constantly running for these chews or these toys or something to keep your dog busy and keep your dog occupied while you want to watch your favorite show for just one hour a week, think about, well, maybe this is stemming from an issue and a behavioral issue more that has to do with anxiety. And what other things could I do to maybe help my dog through his anxiety rather than just see him ferociously chew on something 24 seven all day long or start self mutilating or start being destructive with, you know, the upholstery or something else. Yeah. And I, you know, I tell people, you know, aside from the, well, it can turn into this emotional disturbance in the dog, but when they're young, I, you know, use the human analogy of teenagers that are acting out, looking for boundaries. They're doing stupid crap and yeah. they're looking for an adult to say, hey, don't do that. And nobody does anything. They do more, more stupid stuff, you know? And um, that's the way I look at a dog that starts chewing on a couch. I'm right there. No, you don't do that. That's not acceptable. I'm not saying I uh, physically correct the dog. But I'm stopping the behavior right away. It's interrupting the behavior. Yeah, I'm interrupting the behavior. I'm going to say, hey, you, you want to chew on something? I will, you know, fi set up a scenario where they can chew on something in an acceptable way. They can relieve this, this need to chew. I'm not going to be stressed about them ingesting something that's going to hurt them. They're not going to destroy property. I want them to grow up to be a dog that can just be loose in the house. That's the goal of a puppy. Loose in the house yeah. without stress. Yeah. Potty training is dialed in. They're not chewing crap up. Uh, we had a thunderstorm a couple of days ago. Jess's dog was loose in the house. We checked the camera. We have a nest cam. And we saw she was stressed. She was moving around the house a little bit. She didn't destroy anything. Fortunately, it was a relatively short thunderstorm. 
But we felt bad for her. And when we got home, we checked, <laughs> hey, is she okay? We looked around. Did she chew anything up? Did she freak out? The, the worst she would do is if there was a, a box of Kleenex, she'd maybe pull all the Kleenex out and start chewing those up. A little up. stress response. Yeah, but I mean, it's normal for dogs, uh, you know, with thunderstorms and stuff like that to get anxious, get stressed. And it's nice to have them in a crate where you can just, they feel calmer too. A dog that gets stressed out over noises, if they can now, now they're panicking and running all over the house. Where's mom? And looking all over the house, they're just getting more and more worked up. Yeah, and that's up, a know? good point that you brought up too, because a lot of dogs, it's funny, this thunderstorm topic, right? Because I feel like we've had two pretty big thunderstorms in July. And this is just like a thing in the Midwest. Like I was raised outside of Chicago. Like I went to school in Michigan. Like we have thunderstorms, right? It's freaking no. summer. Like Tornado three, warning. Yeah, like three or four times a week. Like, yeah, it's thunderstorms. It's summer. Out here in New England, you guys don't get thunderstorms. So, like, the dogs are like, what is this thunder? Oh, my God, this is crazy. So, we've had two this month. So, this has been a lot. But if you do live in an area like the Midwest that gets thunderstorms all the time, be conscientious that the less movement your dog has available to them, the safer they will probably feel and the better they'll probably feel. I'm not saying you shouldn't be able to check on them. But then this begs the question, oh, my dog ruins his bed, scratches his bed, chews his bed when it's windy out, when there's fireworks going on, when there's thunder going on. Okay, totally get that. I understand the dog is now alleviating the stress response, similar to talk, Scott talking about like going over to the Kleenex box and being like, holy fuck, is the world going to end? I'm going to pull the Kleenex out. Take the bed out then. If that is a pattern that you know, my dog is good with his bed until it's a windy night, it's a windy night, pull the bed out for the night. The dog will be fine. Not going to wake up with calluses on its elbows, but it's less of a way for the dog to alleviate his anxiety. Do other things too. Put essential oils on, put music on, do acupressure on your dog before it goes to bed. Whatever the heck you want to do. I'm not saying just take the bed away, but by taking the bed away, this coping mechanism of like, oh my God, I'm stressed. I don't know what to do. Okay, I'm going to dig the bed. Okay, I'm going to destroy the bed. Okay, I'm going to do this to the bed. Take away that option so the dog's stress isn't controlling its behavior because that does not seem to be a productive route from anything we've seen in the past 10 years of training together and the past 20 years of really intensely working with dogs. If you have an unhealthy route and you don't curb it somehow, it normally never gets healthy or it gets worse. I'm just going to let you know. <laughs> and I will say with regard to having a bed or a pad in the crate, if you have purchased four to six beds that go in the crate that have all been destroy, destroyed, you really need to start evaluating why you keep putting those yeah. in. You keep buying them. Uh, they're expensive. Your dog is destroying them. And because uh, I had a dog like this uh, early on when, when I first met Jess, I had this dog who was older at that point. He was eight or nine. And <laughs> Still I couldn't gave, have a bed. <laughs> no, he, he, the dog could never have a bed all his life. So I, I went through probably a half a dozen beds. I'm looking at ballistic beds. I'm looking, can we make one out of Kevlar? You know, I'm just trying. In my mind... I wanted him to My have a bed. My loco needs he, a bed. He didn't need a friggin' bed. <laughs> I thought he needed, he should have a bed. I didn't want his elbows to get all calloused, all this crap, you know? Uh, after about four or five beds, and he never ingested it. It would just, it would just be like a big, all this fluffing, and all this stuff all over the inside of his crate. <laughs> he was like he, an interior decorator. Yeah, so I stopped, and he hadn't had a bed before I met Jess for about five years, five or six years. And she's like, oh, he needs a bed. I said, no, he doesn't need a bed. <laughs> he ripped it up. She's I like, think oh, he's old in. now. He's old now. He can have a bed. <laughs> so she gets a bed put in. It was good for like three weeks or uh, a month. I don't even totally remember. fine. I don't even remember. Come in one morning, yeah. just trashed. <laughs> and then you went and even got another bed. I, think I, don't, did like I, I don't know how that whole situation played out, but it's true. And if your dog does have a bed issue, we would go to Primo Pads first. But we've had dogs destroy Primo Pads too. There's nothing yeah. surefire on the market that's going to make this help. But if we have chewing on beds... On, you know, their own selves, if they're the dogs, if you have chewing on furniture, if you have chewing on yourself, if you have chewing on the kids clothing, why is this happening? Where is it coming from? And just be able to be conscious of it. My Malinois constantly <clears throat> used to swallow stuffed toys when he was little. And I just used to say to Scott, oh, it's fine. It's fine. He's, he throws them up. Everything's fine. It's fine. One time, he swallowed a sock. It wasn't fine. He had an obstruction surgery. Like, it was a huge to-do. Just because your dog has done something in the past, the, what mental state are they in to do it? Like, the, these are all things that relate back to why did he go back to that behavior? Why is he doing that behavior? And yes, dogs should be able to be out and be loose and not have stress. But this specific dog, Sarge, we've talked about him a lot on the podcast. He was loose for probably two years, never chewed anything in his life. One night, he chewed, I saw him on drop cam. He went to chew a shoelace on the 
win the windowsill. Like, I don't know why, maybe because Bam was stressing out, maybe something else. But that was a signal to me. My dog, who's been living loose for two years, is getting more anxious again. This is a problem. One, make sure that the shoelaces come out in his poop or he throws them up and he's not obstructed. And two, there's a reason for it. It's not just by happen chance that this 12, 13-year-old dog that I've had for over a decade decided to then chew something again. There's a reason it's happening. So be conscious of it. Yeah, and more importantly than wondering why it's happening... Stop it as soon yes. as possible. You see it, don't allow that scenario to replicate itself again where you know that's going to happen again for the health of the dog. Yeah. Well, yeah, you need to find out why is it happening. That would be maybe a luxury to know why it happens. We don't know what dogs think. So what's more important to me is that it doesn't continue to happen because yeah. it's just a matter of time before it's going to be hopefully just a $3,000 surgery. Yeah, but Worst case is dog. the dog dies, yeah. which really yeah. is just brutal Nobody wants to go through that, certainly me. And people that allow it and then, you know, have the surgeries and still don't give a shit, I feel like you just shouldn't, and it's they not, shouldn't have a dog. It's not even that, oh, something bad could happen. It's just that chewing in an insatiable way is not natural, especially past puppyhood. So be conscious of what you're seeing. Be conscious of what you're giving your dog to chew on. And yes, chewing is a great outlet. We want dogs to enjoy this. Wolves in the wild, tearing things apart. Yes, chewing is a part of who dogs should be. However... If it's the only way you can exist with your dog is if they're like chewing something or destroying some woodblock or something else, maybe there's a mental issue going on that you should address. Yeah. That's the one of the reasons. Cause. One of the reasons why I, I like the raw diet was, um, you know, they they're crunching up. You know, when they when the dogs were younger, I was giving them, you know, just I gave my dog Loco, who loves to tear shit apart. I gave him a whole turkey. I just threw a turkey into his dog run. That really helped the bed <laughs> live. He longer. just crunched that thing down into a little ball. You know. <laughs> And, uh, you know, they can they can do that stuff with raw poultry. You know, yeah. those bones are not going to hurt them. Yeah. But when they get older, the bodies, just like humans, the bodies don't process raw bones as well, even though it's cartilage, but they just don't process everything as well. Just like if I ate too much tomato sauce, I don't process that as well as <laughs> there, I did 20 years there, ago. There we go. <laughs> we don't know <laughs> when he ever processed food well, but that's neither here nor there at this point. All right, so and I'm going to give you guys a challenge here. At the end of this episode, we talked about chewing the whole thing. If you have a dog, for some reason, a little white dog is popping into my mind, but if you have a dog that has never enjoyed chewing anything in its entire life, see what you can find that that dog might like. Pick up some freaking marrow bones at the butcher. They have little small ones. Supervise the dog. See if that dog would enjoy that. Check out farm hounds. The ones with the fur, some dogs are freaked out by them. Some dogs are like, oh my God, I'm ripping apart a wild animal. Find something that your dog does love getting into because I promise something is out there for your dog. So if you've never seen your dog enjoy something with chewing, up your chewing game as well. And side note, since we didn't even mention it, if you have any resource guarding and there's any chewing involved in any way, shape, or form, make sure your dog is on a leash so you can at least pick that leash up and keep yourself safe. Yeah, and I will say, you know, before you're giving your dog, and ideally when you're starting with a puppy, you want to be able to teach them to, to leave it. Or drop it, At yeah. the very least, you're doing a, an exchange I need that back. Here's a treat for giving it to me. Teach them a drop it command because my Malinois that I have now is a big resource guarder. And if I just reach in and start pulling, you know, taking stuff away from him, there's a possibility I could get bit. He sounds like a lion. <laughs> so, but I taught him to leave it really quick. I just, when I want to take anything away from him, I walk up to him, tell him sit, and he just pops up into a sit with a big bone in his mouth. And I just put my hands on the bone and say, drop it. He gives it to me. And then that's, that's Normally it. it turns into a love fest. There's yeah, no it's train, not, but it's yeah. not a big deal. But I mean, when he's like totally in his own world there, it's like I'm a little apprehensive about just rushing in. My ego isn't that big that I have to like, you know, put the beat down on my 80 pound Malinois because he's crawling at me, you know? All right. Anyway. We'll, we'll address that resource guarding yeah. topic. A different we'll do a topic. video on yeah, him. Yeah, a different podcast. It always goes back to video Cousteau. All right, you guys. Thank you for joining us. Um, in August, we have a lot of exciting guests that have cool products, some cool programs, a lot of fun stuff coming up. And in the meantime, keep it quirky. The views and opinions expressed by the hosts, guests, or callers of this program do not necessarily reflect the opinions of the Studio 21 Podcast Cafe, the United Podcast Network, its partners or affiliates.